So let me show you how it works. I'm using a program right now that I've used for several years called XNView. And basically, it's just a way of organizing images and seeing thumbnails. It reads almost every image format out there. Uh, and you can do, you can make slideshows, you can do all sorts of things. But I found it really useful so that I don't have to keep going to Bridge, which is a resource hog, or uh, open up images in Photoshop because, excuse me, most things only read JPEG and BMP. Uh, so this, I can well, look at Targa's tips, all sorts of stuff. I can tag them so that if I'm like uh, looking for textures and I can organize them with favorite folders and even do processing. So it's really nice. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a texture I made and I'm going a tiling texture that I made in Photoshop and I'm just going to drag it down to the bottom left here and it pulls up a menu saying where do I want to put this in and do I just want to tweak the normal map or just this I'm just gonna say main and what that does is that makes it so that I'll have the opportunity of tweaking all of those things so I'm just gonna choose main input and then it drops it in you could try this with any image just to see but you can see how that looks right left mouse button just rotates around middle mouse pans right mouse button zooms in and out very uh, minus the alter option button that's very uh, Maya-esque you'll notice and it looks okay except for the fact it's a little bit too bulbous you know it's like the the wood planks are a little too curvy too bumpy I want them a little bit flatter you know depending on what your look is so here's the things you can do question Alrighty then. So I've got my texture in and I've got a few things I can do. So up at the top right, I could change my resolution. Now, of course, boosting it higher than what initially was isn't going to add more detail, but it does uh, give you more options of the textures that might be generated for it. But you can't just oh, I want this picture to be a better, clearer picture, so I'm going to up the resolution. It doesn't work that way. So that's why it's good to start with a very high-res texture and then always scale it down to what you need as opposed to low-res and then trying to push it higher. And the way you change the resolution is by changing the uh, output size? Yep. So we're going to boost it. My, no, my texture was like uh, close to a 1024, so I'm going to boost it to a 1024. And what we would see is that the texture gets higher resolution. Since it originally was not higher than a 2K, my boosting it to a 2048 does not make hardly any difference. So I'm just going to work at 1024. Right now it's being dynamically lit by the environment. It's using HDR lighting. That's why it seems to fit really well with the background. Over here, I have, let me lower, say fit. So over here, for some of you, it may be at the top. On mine, it's at the bottom. I've got the different texture outputs that it's showing. You can click on those tabs to see what the roughness map, based off of what it looks like right now, metallic map, normal map, height, which would have been your bump map, and ambient occlusion, what all those look like. I haven't adjusted any of them, but that's what they look like by default with the default setup of the properties that's in it right now. Go back to the base color. 
And I'll just minimize this so I could see my 3D view because this is the one that's going to uh, show me, you know, basically what I want to see the most. So over in the right where I have my properties, the first tab is global. So if I open that up, we could see we can adjust a few of the basic things. Like, do I want this texture to tile? Or at least, do I want to be able to see it tiling? Because this is a good chance for me to see if, if it truly is a seamless texture. This is also a way like of inverting the relief. The relief is its fancy way of saying uh, the bump map or the normal map. And by default, the lighter pixels bump up and the darker pixels bump in. So let's say my image, the grout or the spaces between the, you know, the bricks or the wood was actually lighter instead of darker, then I'd probably want to invert the relief so that the grout is pushed in, even though it's a lighter pixel. In this case, I don't have to. The light equalizer is kind of interesting. Basically, when you're making a texture and you're trying to make a normal map or bump map out of it, you don't want light information or shadow information on your texture because, of course, the light uh, pixels bump up and the dark pixels bump down. So, in other words, I don't want to use a texture that has a shadow or a stain or something like that on it to tile it. The light equalizer, when you move it, tries to normalize that so that you can get rid of those variations to flatten it out a wee bit. But if I do it too much, look what happens. Now, I could still adjust it. That might still work, but uh, we could see how it radically changes it, and it gets that information of the dark and the light out. See? If I go to relief, these are the frequencies and the intensity of the normal and the bump slash bump mapping. So the low, mid, and high frequencies you could think of as the light pixels, the medium pixels, like gray pixels, and the darker pixels, and how it's actually trying to calculate what range I want to have affected. And then the normal intensity is the overall intensity of it. So if I turn that down, like to zero, you see it flattens out entirely. You see that? So that's with no intensity whatsoever, and you see the texture just flattens. So I'm going to crank that up. But then so that I don't want all the grains of wood necessarily to be bumpy, but I want the grout to be bumpiest, right? Or not the grout, but the spacing between the planks. So that's where I'd go into my low, mid, and high frequencies to start to adjust that. You see in my low frequencies, if I pull it to a negative, I intensify the grains of wood. Whereas if I pull it to the right, I still have the spaces in between, but it's starting to flatten out those beams. You see that? Yes. depends on what texture you're looking for. <laughs> It'll look at the dark pixels and push them in and the light pixels and push them out. It doesn't know what a human face is. It knows the colors of pixels. So it is looking at things in a very mathematical these are the light pixels, these are the dark pixels. But as you can see, while I'm adjusting this, 
I'm starting to get it to where I might want it. It's not as bulbous as it was. And I could start to tone down. some of the grain. Relief pinch is kind of, oh, let me scroll down a little. So normal format, there's DirectX and OpenGL. Typically, you're going to use DirectX. It's just a different format of how it's calculating the 3D and the lighting. Uh, relief input. So from a height map or a normal map. So this is also like if I brought in a texture, maybe I already had a height map built for it that I made in Photoshop or a normal map that I had been built for it, maybe from a high-res model to a low-res model. And then the relief pinch, watch this, this is kind of interesting. As I pinch it, it looks at those edges and it's doing this. So depending on what you're trying to do, this is actually a cool effect on certain things. Um, but you don't want to go like nuts with it because yeah it, it does some weird stuff and I definitely I don't need it for what this is so right now all I'm doing is just fine-tuning the normal map with the uh, between global and relief and giving it the amount of bump or lack thereof that I want it to have question Uh, you can click right here, reset tweaks to default values, but it might reset everything. Okay, okay so let's say I like this. That's kind of nice. Not too heavy. Now I start to go into these other elements, like the diffuse and the roughness. So the diffuse is affecting the color map. Okay. It's luminosity, so how bright is it or dark? The hue shift, uh, as the name suggests, is where I can change the color of this texture to whatever it is I wanted. Like maybe I wanted this to be more of a mahogany kind of uh, texture going towards red, so I would shift it towards that. The contrast and the saturation, these are all things you guys are probably more familiar with. And would that, would that change depending on if it's a morning situation versus an evening situation the lighting? This isn't the lighting. This is the actual texture. So I'm tweaking out the color and the intensity of the texture, and this the lighting is just showing how it looks in this lighting scheme. But this is the actual texture. If you look down... I've made it more red, so if you look at the texture here, you can see it's more red in the actual diffuse color. Contrast, saturation. So here I have more of a red wood, you see that? So the one perk of this and the thing that should be taken away from this is that when I you find a texture, one of the things that people make the mistake on if they're looking for stock footage or for a texture to tweak out is that they don't manipulate the texture at all. They find it or they keep searching for hours for the perfect texture instead of finding something that's remotely close and then tweaking it to what they need. 
right? So don't don't spend hours looking for one texture. Find one that's remotely close and then make it into what you need if you're going from that. Or take your own photographs and, you know, do it that way. Okay, so I'm liking that so far. Uh, the like equalizer is going to be based off of the global setting of the light equalizer here. So depending on what, you know, what I had that set to, it's going to vary things up. But if I haven't really done much, it's not going to do a lot. Now looking the the light cancellation will check that out. Every texture is going to be a little bit different based on how much or how little you want to tweak it. Once I've gotten this down the way I want it, I go to the next thing, which would be my roughness slash glossiness. So this is how reflective and shiny or, or how reflective this surface is. So roughness, uh, no roughness means the object is smooth, right? The smoother it is, the more it's like polished like a chrome ball and you would see more of a clear reflection. The rougher it is, the more you're actually going to see um, microscopic imperfections diffusing the reflection itself. So as I go to the roughness value, watch this when I go to zero. Zero means it is so totally smooth. So what we have here, what's smooth? Water. <laughs> you know, a polished chrome ball. So that's why it looks less so chromey and shiny. If I took away the normal map, you would see a clear glassy reflection on this. The only thing disrupting it right now is the normal map. So... Typically, you don't necessarily want that. Depends on what it is. Whereas if I crank it to a 1, it's matte. There is no, uh, it is so rough that there is no reflection whatsoever to it. So you have to kind of find what that, that happy medium is. And then you have to adjust what, what is influencing the roughness. Now, one other thing is we can add, and we'll get into that, adding grunge or different things to it where I could have dirt, kind of a grungy dirt on it, and then have it so that those areas are not reflective. They're actually kind of crusty and dry, but then other areas are shiny, like imagine dirt on a, on a polished floor. Yep. Look what happens when I cranked up uh, roughness variations from curves. So certain lines you can see are really shiny. Now if I look down below at my roughness map, so you can see what it's doing here, this gives you a better idea of what's happening when I change it. Do you see, uh, like when I look at my roughness map and I start changing these properties, you can see where it's being rough and where it isn't. Now, the odd thing about this one is that the values are reversed. So where it's white is where it actually won't be as shiny, and where it's black is where it is. So that's why the grout, you'll notice, is white, but I don't get any shine in the, uh, I keep calling it grout, but the space between the, the planks. So just remember that when you're making a roughness map, if I want something to 
be rough, I make it white. If I want it to be like really polished, I want it to be black. And then I just go in between from there. But I could really start to fine tune certain things in here. And these will vary depending on what the image is. Then that takes us to the metal metallic specular section. Let's look at that metallic. So metal creation from main input. So it's taking the information from a uh, from the image that we brought in. If I had already made an image that I wanted to, I would choose uh, metallic input, and then I would have brought in an image for that channel to base it off of and be able to tweak it from there. Uh, metal from diffuse, from the RGB, the chrominance, or luminance. Let's go with uh, the default. Let's go to uh, the key settings, the range and the softness. So check this out. The moment I start to crank this up, it's going through the values. And you get, you see how this metallic is literally giving it just that? It has that almost like a die cast metal kind of shininess to it when I crank it up. And then I can soften that out. Where did you access the metallic part? Was it under outputs? Or else? Uh, under roughness, there's a metallic specular. Would I use a metallic for wood? Most cases, not. <laughs> you know, unless it had some sort of weird paint on it. Um, so the metalness of it, I would literally use for things that are more, uh, that do have more of a metallic kind of uh, surface to them. Because of the layer of shininess that it gives. Ambient occlusion is the next tab. We talked about ambient occlusion a little bit. You see it has the low, medium, and high frequencies. So once again, uh, let's look at the ambient occlusion map. Here it is here. See that? So this is my ambient occlusion. And I can adjust the ambient occlusion on that piece because right now it's interesting. It's taking it based off of the dark and light values. So in other words, the wood planks that are darker, it's assuming that they are receded inward more. Therefore, it's casting a little more shadow into them. But I could take that away to flatten them out more. You see that? and I can fine tune them. Where this makes uh, really good sense is when you have a texture map that actually has, uh, on an object that has a lot of uh, different crevices and stuff of that nature. Question? Okay, so we saw the ambient occlusion. Now here's a fun one, which is uh, grunge. So with the grunge map, let's say we're going to turn grunge on. 
And you might not notice a lot right now, but watch this. Right under it has grunge choice, right? So uh, let me crank up the grunge a little bit. I'm turning up the base color opacity so that you could see it. Do you see that there's these darker spots on my texture now? Watch what happens when I change the different styles of dirt. See that? This one's nice, uh, number six, because this one's really good for staining across the bottom of something. Like, let's say you have a wall that has water staining or dirt along the bottom. But here's the really cool part about the grunge and how its application is. I can actually go in and change the contrast of the grunge, see that, to dirt uh, make the dirt stand out more. But I could also do some really cool stuff with how it's affecting things like the normal map and the, uh, the reflectivity. So normal opacity, look at that. See how it's actually corroding? Isn't that sweet? I can invert the grunge. I can adjust the adaptive shape of it. This is one way you could definitely do it. Oh, check this out. So I've got it shiny everywhere but where the dirt is. Yeah. Or I could do adjust the metallic opacity. can adjust the balance of it so check it out you could have it actually grow see this so as it's going slowly have something corrode if I wanted to animate it I could actually animate it in Maya or a game engine But you see, like, there's a lot of nice little options we can do to this. How it's being affected by the normal map. Even how it's being blended on top of the existing texture. Now, once I've had this texture, like let's say, uh, oh, almost forgot. Advanced and outputs. So the outputs is where you would turn off and on all the different things that you want to output uh, to a, uh, whatchamacallit, to, uh, to the texture files, right? And that, which ones you're gonna output is dependent on which channels you need. Base color, like I've changed that. Uh, roughness map, that kind of stuff. Specular, if I'm using that. Normal map or height map, which would be a bump map. This is cool. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. You could do some really cool stuff in it. Your height map would also be... Um, a displacement actually
And once I have all of these set up the way I want, to export the channels out, I would go up to the top where it says export as bitmap. And here is where I would check which of all of these I would want. Now, typically, I don't want all of the different maps that it wants to spit out because that's a lot and you're not going to use all of them and it'll waste a lot of space and time. So a few things just so you can see how I do this. I point it to the source images folder of my project. I would change the format to like a, a TGA, you know. Sometimes uh, depending on like if I'm using certain things for a game engine or whatever, I might use a bitmap where it says base name and you see it says uh, percentage G underscore percentage uh, O. Yeah. If I put my cursor over it, it tells me what those names are. And if I look all the way at the bottom, you can see it's giving me this freakishly long name, bitmap to material three base color dot TGA. And I'd say, well, I don't want all that. I would go up here and get rid of the percentage G. And I would type in, oh, red, wood, then under, then leave it underscore O. And when I do that, look at the bottom now. It'll, if I click on like base color, you see it says red, wood, underscore, base color, dot TGA. And that makes more sense, right? If I'm doing like multiples, I don't want them to all be bitmap to material, you know, color because they're going to overwrite each other and it's going to be weird. But I do want them to hold on to what uh, channel or output they're supposed to go, you know, or what input they're supposed to go into, which is the output. So normal map or gloss, I want that name in there so I know which one is which. And what I would do is I would uncheck where it says all outputs, uncheck that, and then check the ones that I want. Base color roughness. I could always check my down here to see which ones are actually being used. Ambient occlusion, that's a good one. to play around with. I might use the uh, metallic. Normal and bump map. You can see those. And that would look good. And then once I have those checked, the ones that I want, I would say export and it will export all of those uh, into my source images folder and then I could start plugging them in to my material either in the game engine or inside of Maya or whatever program that I'm going to use them. See? Spits them out pretty fast. So this is really good for certain textures, especially tiling textures. If I were to do this inside of Photoshop, uh, I would have potentially made a, uh, a bump map by taking that image, um, desaturating it, and then adjusting the levels to get it so that the, the spaces between the planks are dark and that the planks are much, much lighter and more even, so I'm not getting all the little details. The question comes in of which one to use, that's really up to you. What's gonna be faster, what's gonna give you the better result the quickest way, right? Um, this one I use for tiling textures a lot, it generates them really quick and then I can tweak those things out. Uh, 
uh, you you go up to uh, yep. If I wanted to, uh, if I'm ready to actually um, go to the next one, I would click the little reload, these little um, arrows here. If I had had one of those inputs, remember, it asked like when we put it in main, it's like, oh, this texture you're dragging in, is this an ambient or is this this or is it that? I would have just put it in that particular input. I'm good. Oh, just, oh, you mean saving the images out? Yeah, because, um... <clears throat> export to, as, as export as bitmap? Export as bitmap, but the explanation of a percentage G underscore percentage zero. Get rid of the uh, percentage G. Give it whatever name, like mine I did Redwood. Okay, so and then you still have underscore percentage zero, or O. Yeah, because that'll tell it, that'll uh, tag it so that the individual textures will have what they are. Color map, okay. diffuse, normal map, that kind of stuff. So that's the little uh, thing you type in so that you know when it spits it out what the heck it is okay. without having to open it up. Right. <laughs> Plus, if I'm using it with other programs and I'm using substance materials, it'll automatically plug it into the right spot. Like if I go into Substance Painter and I'm using this file designation, it's gonna look in the name and say, oh, normal map, I'm automatically gonna put you into the normal map spot. So naming convention starts to become a really important thing at this point. Yeah, <laughs> question? Cool. You guys good? So that should work out. I'll pause this one.